good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're dialing in from. Today, uh, last webinar, uh, Rob was in the office next to me in our corporate headquarters in Orlando, Florida. Uh, this webinar, I'm in the office next to Rob in our EMEA headquarters in Dublin, Ireland. And as you can see, it's pretty miserable here. It's cold and it's wet. So I mean, I'm that's a fine Irish day. <laughs> Fine. Soft Irish day is what they look, look how many layers I have to go outside. I have to bring, you know, the first time I have That's to just, wear, you're, you're just gone soft, <laughs> Danny, since you became like an American. You're just gone soft. Yeah, it's, um, it, it, I, I'm sorry, but the weather here is not pleasant. So, and it's also four, four o'clock in the evening and it's already nearly dark. So, um, uh, if you recall last time on the webinar, we've, this is our third in the series uh, of our webinars coming up to Zero Trust World. Zero Trust World is an event in Orlando, Florida, where the sun shines and it's much warmer than Ireland. If you like the sunshine and you like to learn about cybersecurity threats and you'd like to learn how to defend against them, February 1 through 3 this year at the Omni in Champions Gate, Orlando, we have three days where we're going to teach you how to harden your Windows Server, how to harden Active Directory, how to uh, protect your endpoints, how to protect your servers. We're going to teach you how to hack with rubber duckies, with pineapples, with various other techniques to bypass cybersecurity solutions so you can better defend yourself against attacks. Um, what we're doing is this is a series of webinar. The first one ended with me tanking Rob's computer or his test computer, as he points out. Did you ever get that fixed when you came back to Florida, Rob? I don't know. Ask Martin because I brought it straight to the US and told them to fix it. Yeah, so we, we did a competition of who did the most damage, and uh, I won. Um, then we um, did a webinar on pineapples, which was taking over the Wi-Fi and capturing data. We managed to crash the drone into a wall in my office. I blame the paint for being cheap and coming off the wall <laughs> uh, in our practice, but we did manage to take over the Wi-Fi, kind of. It was a little bit flaky. It so worked. It worked. The vote they spoke. Did. The poll the said spoke. it worked. Yeah, it was a little bit ambiguous, but the poll said 70% of people said it was worked. And you don't need 70% of people to elect a president. So uh, <laughs> uh, if 70% said it worked, I guess you get credit for that one. Yeah. This time, I'm going to try and take over Rob's machine with a reverse shell. Now, we've got two types of reverse shells we're going to show you. Um, one is a traditional reverse shell, which Rob's going to show you. And the other one is my custom reverse shell, which... Um, with the help of my development team, because I, I've gotten lazier in my old age, I got them to write, throw it together for me in Visual Studio last week. Um, and we're going to see how it works on the reverse shell. So we're going to do this. Before we begin, um, if we can put a poll up, do, am I going to gain access to Rob's machine without triggering an alert on the antivirus, which is Windows Defender? Um, or any kind of alert, and will I be able to upload his data? So if we, if you think the answer to that question is yes, vote yes. If you think it's no, vote yeah, no. Now I see the polls up, so I see the answers coming in. Oh wow! Nine. They know us too well, Danny. Without triggering an alert on the antivirus, I'm going to steal his data. I'm going to get on his machine. And I'm going to run an executable just for shits and giggles. Tech, the technical term for that, Danny, is shiggles. Shiggles. Okay, we have 91% so far saying, yes, I'm going to succeed. 9% saying, I'm no. No, so I'm guessing the 9% saying no are threat locker competitors who are joining our webinar for amusement. So, um, okay, let's go um, begin. Do you want to show first a traditional reverse shell, Rob, if you want to set up your screen? Certainly, I will do that now. Make sure I'm sharing the right screen. And by the way, just to clarify, what a reverse shell is essentially access to a console on a remote computer, getting instructions from a server or another remote computer. So essentially, you take over a victim, the instructions are issued. A RMM is technically a reverse shell. So ConnectWise or um, Kasei is RMM, the not intended with the bad reasons, but they allow you shell access to a machine so you can make things. There's also lots of reverse shells that are created for hackers. Um, by companies who help people distribute ransomware and make it easy to have prepackaged tools. Uh, you can also have custom reverse shell. So we've got, first of all, the, the hacker reverse shell, which Rob has downloaded, and he's going to try and gain access. You've got two machines there, one with an antivirus, one without. So um, Just to stress, this is the not with an antivirus one, because I had one hell of a time trying to get this payload onto that machine with AV, and we'll show that now in a second as well. So this okay, is so we're gonna, not protected by AV. 
you just spoiled my my poll. I was going to ask everyone, do we think we're going to get past the antivirus with the Kali Linux version? <laughs> and uh, you spoiled my... Sorry. You spoiled my uh, poll there. So this is, if you can explain your setup here, Ross, uh, Rob. So basically, we have a VM running Kali Linux, um, lots of hacking tools included. I had a chance to play with a few of them, but obviously what we're using today is the reverse shell. Um, really, really, really easy to do. Like I couldn't get over how easy to do. As you can see, literally you just give it an IP address, you give it a port, it generates a playload, creates an executable file for you and listens on that port. Okay, so that's basically what it's doing now. It's generating a payload. So that's going to give me effectively a payload.exe. Okay, now uh, I have a payload.exe um here's one i prepared earlier i don't know if that's something that everybody's going to get it's probably me showing my age thing but yes i've got a payload that i created earlier i'm just going to wait for the listener to launch which well, there's a poll while the listener is launching who remembers that here's one i prepared earlier <laughs> i don't <laughs> even remember i just know it uh, on the tv <laughs> don't uh, show your age people i already did so long story short as you can see it is basically now listening on port 5001 on that machine now, that could be a publicly accessible server, okay? So in this case, obviously, it's on the LAN, two machines talking to each other, but that could be anywhere. That could be out in the internet. So it's not something that is limited to uh, two machines on the same network. As I said, this is the, here's one I created earlier. So it's the payload, basically, that this creates, okay? Now, when I run that payload on my victim PC, what we should see over on the attacker's PC is this. Okay, which is a shell opened. So as you can see, it shows me the connections that this has received. So as I said, bear in mind, this could be out in the internet. So this could be accessible to anyone. Now, once I've done that, basically, I can interact with that shell. So if I do sessions minus I and the session number, as you can see, I now have access to a command prompt shell on that machine. So that's my downloads folder. So if I do DIR here, as you can see, same stuff. If I go back into my, sorry, documents folder, I can have a mooch around here and see what's going on. Okay. I can always also run commands, which is pretty scary. So if I do, for example, notepad, you'll notice here in the background, notepad has just magically appeared. I can call, for example, and I know you're going to show you, you're going to show this, so I don't want to steal your thunder, Danny, but I can also run, okay, I can run applications. Now, bear in mind that foo.exe that I just ran is one that was living locally on this machine. Okay, Danny's going to show you an even scarier one, which is the machine, uh, that file appears effectively out of nowhere. But that fundamentally is what a reverse shell looks like. So listeners created on the attacker's machine, something is run on the victim's machine and the victim machine reaches out to the attacker's machine and can be exploited in this way. Over to you. Okay, so before I do that, just for argument's sake, your payload.exe when you try and copy it onto a protected Windows Defender machine. <laughs> Let's doesn't... just do that. So here's our payload.exe. I have my protected machine over here somewhere. I'm just going to drag it over. I'm going to paste my payload. Very quickly, Windows Defender gets very unhappy. OK, now I'm going to explain why this is, because hackers make tools for other hackers to use. And if you want to distribute ransomware, you can subscribe and you can pay for You can get some of these tools free. Uh, the more popular the tools become, the closer they are to the top of Google, the easier it is to find, the more likely the antivirus knows about it. Smart hackers that get the big pay paydays don't use very well-known tools. They're either very, very quick and do it at zero day, or they write their own tools. So um, in your case, um, uh, you, you found something too close to the top of Google, therefore it was blocked by an antivirus. I'm going to use a different approach because I used to use this approach more often. And I'm going to show you my screen here. So let's do this. Uh, so one is my SQL Server here. I'm going to delete a load of rows here. Just want to I want to tidy up. Um, result because we use SQL just because we didn't we're lazy. So and I have two tables in SQL. Now what I did is you can see my screen okay there, Rob? Can you? Yes, I can, Danny. OK, um, essentially, we created a little program. And this is the way I used to do it. And um, 
this is how many lines are in code in the program. There's what, well, how many lines there? 10, including the while statement. And then we got some commands to get some extra lines to get responses from a service. And then we, we call a server and we basically say, get me a list of commands to run and then send me a list of all responses back to the server. Very, very easy, very, very simple. Uh, not likely to trigger an antivirus with that little code. Uh, interesting fact, what I did do is I did report this to Microsoft like 15 times that it was bad and Microsoft blocked it. So then I changed the order of the lines of code, recompiled it and ran it again smoothly. So um, very little code. Um, if you're at Zero Trust World, we're actually going to give you this code. We're going to show you how it works. And we're going to do this in one of our labs at Zero Trust World. So um, the extra bonus for showing off for Zero Trust World. Okay, so I've got these lines of code. I've got my SQL server. This is essentially a server in the cloud. So I'm connected to a server here on the internet. Uh, it's posted, hosted in Azure, I think. And my, my client connects to it. So I'm going to go into here. I have a table called command. I can basically type any command I want in here and it can run. Now, before I do that, Rob, can you That's share what your I was screen? Gonna say, should I be running it? Yeah, can you share your screen for me? Yes, I can. So I have sent a payload to Rob. Now, bear in mind, we're just executing this payload. Um, if we look here, we've got literally a X, what looks like an Excel document. I put an Excel icon on it just for extra Notice view. as well, Windows Defender is running and is blocking and did block that thing a moment ago. So I've got this document from Danny. Staff salaries looks very interesting, very important. I open it. That. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. Some ways to deliver this program, by the way. We're not going to deliver it in this, but we will go through more ways to zero trust. One is in a macro in a Word document, most obvious way. The other one is getting a user to download it. Users really don't know the difference between executables and 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 Excel files. And, and uh, executable files, believe it or not, the more employees, the more likely someone will do that. Uh, you can also deliver it through a vulnerability, the exchange vulnerability being one of them. You can deliver executables on the server there. You can, of course, deliver through RMMs or other vulnerabilities. But in this case, Rob opened this. It didn't work. You didn't get to see all the staff salaries. Um, so I'm going to switch back to my screen now. OK, so I can send in. Now, this isn't the advanced UI that Rob had. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to literally just put in a very basic command, first of all, the IR. This basically has an agent, and then I can. If I wanted to sp spend another eight hours on this, I probably could have written a nice interface that looked like DOS. But basically, here's my command. Uh, Rob's logged in as user. This is IP address, and I can copy the results here. And I can see that Rob has nothing but staff salaries in his folder. Now, I don't want to just write staff salaries. That's a bit boring. So let's come up with some other commands. I've got some here. Um, go so, easy on me, Danny. Sorry? Go easy on me. Go easy on you. Um, so the first one I'm going to do is here is, I might as well go right in and see if I get blocked. And um, by the way, Threat Locker is running on this machine, but it is in monitor only mode. So we'll show you the result. Is that correct? That is we'll show correct. We'll you the results afterwards. Here is my Google Cloud. It is a cloud bucket on the internet. Um, we did this in the rubber ducky. We uploaded a load of data. I'm going to take the same approach, but this time from my reverse shell. I'm actually going to use the same command that I did in my rubber ducky. And that is basically, I'll make this a little bit wider if I can. It's calling PowerShell and saying, iterate through my documents and steal my data. Now, if I run the command results, it has my data, matter. my data, your data. There you go. So, it, ooh. Did I copy that wrong? It seems to have crashed. Let me just check my Google Cloud. Refresh that. Oh, no, it's all the data. So here you go. So I have all of um, Rob's data. How do I, I can't make believe it? you stole my stolen document. Yeah, I've got an access database. Uh, access database? What is that built in the 90s, Rob? <laughs> There's uh, important I've stuff in it, Danny. I've got a spreadsheet, I've got a stolen text file, and I've got a Word document. So I managed to get all five of them. So I was very easily be able to uh, iterate through those files. And just to confirm something here as well. So that is actually the files themselves. It's not just the names of the files. I think you can actually, if you try the text file, Danny, you should be able to look into it and see what's in it. Okay, so let's go into the text file. Just in case people think this is just a list of files. It is not a list of files. It is the actual files themselves. Um important things are in it, Rob. <laughs> important things are in that text file, Danny. 
There you go. So um, so nine percent of the audience was wrong. So now let's run some more interesting things. I want to download an executable. So what I'm going to um, do, ju just to clarify something as well, Danny, I didn't see anything happening on that machine. So okay. it, it's sitting here. I'm logged in. Nothing flashed up. I didn't get any windows, no black screens. Nothing happened. OK, little interesting fact. English keyboards or Irish keyboards and American keyboards are different. And this has bitten me in the ass. How many times today? Because I came in and approximately Rob, one million. Yeah, uh, Rob set, very kindly set me up a docking station with multiple monitors um, and gave me an English keyboard on my American laptop. Excuse me, I gave you an Irish keyboard, Danny. An Irish keyboard made in China. Um, so, uh, and um, uh, so what we did every time I go to hit the backslash key, the backslash key is the enter key in Ireland. So, if you look at the keyboard, I know this is completely going off topic. We have this huge enter key, if we can see that. And that is it, an appropriately sized return key, Danny, not those little yeah. Mickey Mouse things that you've got in, um, in, in USA. Yeah, so when I hit the backslash key, it hits the enter key, which is really annoying me. So I'm going to do it on my laptop. Um, so here I have, I'm going to create a directory called one, two, three, four. Um, I'm going to run that command. And I'm just going to check that that's created because I want to be super careful. So I'm going to get my results. And then I'm going to do um, a DIR of C colon backslash. It really does. If you want to be a hacker, you know, I tell us the amount of college students that apply it throughout like I say, and I want to be a hacker. Um, really, you don't make money in that hacking unless it's illegal. Uh, maybe some ethical hackers do, but most don't. But if you want to be a hacker, you learn IT. The amount of people that come out of college and go, well, I don't want to learn command prompt or PowerShell or code or how the Windows registry works. I just want to learn how to use Kali Linux and do a reverse shell. It really does help if you can run basic commands. So if I see here, I just want to check my directories there because I don't want to show up. I can see my test one, two, three, four. I have the next command here. Now, before and you run this, do I want to share my screen? So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to hit enter on here. I'm going to paste this in. Hopefully, I'm not going to oh, hit enter. Oh, no, I don't know if it hit enter. We'll find out in a second. Um, I'm going to hit this. And Rob, if you, oh, do you want to share your screen? So basically, you're just going to say start that program. <coughs> uh, do, you need, do you need to download it first? Oh, thank you. See. It does help to know what commands do, people. Object exercise, object list. Uh -huh. There you go. Okay, so, so stuff certainly okay. just happened. Okay, so and I'm just going to check if the command is there now because I want to be use my laptop keyboard. Test one, two, three, four. So I'm going to do my directory code and I'll run. Get rid of that. Ooh. And a lot, you don't have to use SQL for this. We use SQL because I don't know what reason we could just use text files. It would have been just as easy. Um, but whenever you you write these, just write in the code as simple as possible is always good. Okay, it's got one file. So the file did download. And then I'm going to run my start command. Um, you Technically, you don't have to run it in a new window. If I don't run it in a new window, though, it can actually wipe out my session. So I want to keep my session, so I'm going to run it in a new window. Oops, I didn't get to share your screen. But go ahead, Rob, share your screen now and show what's on it. I'll do it again, Danny. Okay, my poor, innocent little machine. And oh, I've added. Exit full screen so I can get back to SQL. Sorry, Zoom took over my... So there you go. And there you go. We're downloading your data. Goodbye. Okay. I'm going to finish out with one thing, Rob, because I always like to embarrass people. No. <laughs> Don't even think about it. Sorry. No, just a, there's a couple of questions come through. But one thing that people mentioned about was like, obviously what Threat Locker will do about this. Um, first and foremost, um, that executable that I ran, I wouldn't have been able to run it. Okay, so default and I would have blocked that. Okay, so uh, you got your screen shared there, Rob. Okay, because um, I, 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 I like to get you in trouble at home. So just so you got some explaining to do, let's go here. Oh, ah! okay, you got me in trouble. The PG thirteen version. PG thirteen uh, version of whatever um, somebody was asking. Oh my god! When, when you when you do this to your coworkers, please be more mature than I was earlier on when I was doing it to Rob. Yes, um, definitely. <laughs> We actually managed to find a site that was banned by the Irish government, I think. Um, uh -huh. 
so um when we were sending things around okay um okay so let's move on to some q a and then we'll go through what threat locker did so let's pull up oh there's a lot of questions okay so, so somebody asked a question so david rocks and i'm curious to learn the process of sending a payload to the machine in order to see the process of evading the vent mechanisms on the target machine I'm particularly curious to learn the distinctions of wind blows and different versions versus Unix, Perman's Linux, sorry, Perman's Unix in brackets, Linux, et cetera. So, so I think that the, the process of getting the payload, in this case, I just sent Rob a link to download the URL. Uh, so I just sent him a download to the X to the payload saying, hey, can you download this file? Um, if I was trying to be a little bit more sophisticated, I could put a macro in a Word document to automatically download it. Um, I could um the, the one I like is uh, if you get into Teams, and this is how phishing becomes a gateway to ransomware. If you get into a Teams account on your organization or OneDrive account, a Microsoft 365 account, uploading it into their OneDrive is a cool way, especially when it's got an Excel icon, replacing a file in their OneDrive with the actual malicious payload that has the Excel icon. That's why this one does have an Excel icon, so it's very useful to replace. Uh, you can send it through a vulnerability like the off the office felina vulnerability we do have a video i believe that's on our youtube channel as well if not it's probably can be posted um i'm going to show you how to do that in the one last vulnerability of office felina you could actually just run it directly from office without any interaction from the user and that did bypass um defender and various antiviruses on day one um okay i'm gonna do this um, Someone asked, uh, does Rob's machine have the capacity to display the existence of a foreign process? I mean, basically, that is the foreign process staff salaries.exe. Now, obviously, your average user is not going to go into task manager and looking at lists of processes to try and find weird things, but that is the foreign process. Uh, okay. Are we saying this can be run without privileges or needs admin creds? So absolutely, it can be run without privileges or and it does not need admin creds and i we currently do not have admin creds if we did we'd be finishing this webinar with a blue screen <laughs> so <laughs> like we did the last one but I, we did try that but we do not currently have admin creds you do not need to be an admin to run ransomware to access data to do anything like that you do need to be an admin to blue screen the computer as we found out earlier on so mm -hmm. um yes you do not have to be an admin um could you use a reverse shell to get the target machine to download a malicious file yes david is a short answer to that question i mean that's fundamentally what danny did with that boo.exe uh reached out downloaded it using powershell and executed it so absolutely you could use a reverse shell to do that okay so let's do um, um so can i just say that um kerry wagner um said at the very start man up danny and i think we can all agree with that sentiment that's that was when, that when you were complaining about the weather so i Big thumbs up on that, Gary. Big thumbs yeah. up. Yeah. Rob, I do remember you complaining when you were bright red in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have lost my uh, you, my, my you, Paddy you, in Orlando hue. Actually, I, I do remember at the last webinar, maybe when people watch it, they'll notice he asked the marketing department, could they do something to tone down the redness? D red me. Yes. I D red that. me. Yeah, yes. So, uh, and I, I, I think I said a similar thing back then. Um, Plus, Irish people in Florida without sun cream is not smart. Um, okay. Uh, and let's... this head. Yeah. You know, we do have flat locker caps. So, um, okay, let's let's do final thing. What would we have done to stop this? Because that's important. The machine is in monitor mode. Maybe you can filter by denies on that machine. Um, that is, bear with me one second, Danny. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for one moment. Just hold that thought for a second. I mean, effectively, default deny is the answer to the question. I am sure. Am I still sharing? I am still sharing. Um, let me just show you the other machine first of all. Okay. So, I mean, that is fundamentally the core of what would happen, which is you try and run the thing, it doesn't run. Um, let me just check my one. Which machine is this? this? Is your Kali? This is the one that ran from. This is the first one. So this is VM2. I'm just looking at VM5, and VM5 is misbehaving at the moment. So just park that. But basically, default deny is the answer to that question. What we would have done to block it. Do we lose all of the logs? Do we? Was that locker not running? Um, it was. Let me just re-log in. Oh, you've got the process payload in there as well, by the way. 
So we, we should, because you should see the boo.exe denied as well, because also we're not just talking about denying the reverse shell, we're talking about denying anything that reverse shell tries to do. We're trying to talk about denying PowerShell from being able to access your files, from being able to go out to the internet. These are all things that allow you and harden your environment. Yep, park that thought for a minute, Danny. I hope that ends with the logs. Um, so uh, <laughs> it sounds like no is the answer. I, I have many logs, but I have nothing being blocked because I don't have a default deny policy set up. Oh, so you don't have the executable logs. Uh, I, well, I, you can see it being executed. So for example, let me look uh, for boo, but I don't have them would be denied. And I don't have them would be denied because I don't have a deny default deny policy. In What about ring fencing policies? Do you have those in place? No. I okay, so let's policy. let's show what would have shown in the logs. Thankfully, we didn't do a poll if uh, well, um, <laughs> if Rob set up his threat locker properly for this machine. And yeah. Listen, you just told me we'd have a machine that wasn't blocking stuff with threat locker, which is what I did. Okay, so the first log we would have seen is the sample executable file do not denied, and that would have been the end of it. But let's assume we allowed that because someone on your IT help desk decided, oh, this looks pretty cool. Let me go and allow this sample payroll. See if I can read it. Exe, and see if I can read it. So. If that gets allowed, the next log we would have seen was boo.exe being blocked. Actually, the next log we would have seen was PowerShell failing to download boo.exe because it isn't able to reach out to the internet unless it's a trusted IP address that you specified. So it wouldn't have been able to download boo.exe. That log would have disappeared. Um, if we did allow PowerShell to download um, stuff from the internet, the next log we would have seen was the execution of boo.exe being blocked. Um, and that would have been the end of that. The next log we would have seen um, is PowerShell trying to access his very important files and all of those being denied. If we did allow those important files, we would have stopped PowerShell going out to the internet to upload those files. So lots of things would have been blocked and we would have had lots and lots of denies in the audit. Uh, what's important here, it's not about, of course, it's about using ThreatLocker. We're on a ThreatLocker webinar, but this isn't the point of security. The security point is only allow what you need. Um, the, the, there's always going to be no malware out. There's always going to be bad, no bad things out there. If you only allow what you need, whether it's an executable, whether it needs to go out to the internet, whether it needs to access your files, you harden your environment substantially. Um, now, on to the final things. We want to give away some tickets to Zero Trust World, um, and we have one hosted pass and two tickets. So, hosted pass, we cover your flights, we cover your hotels. Uh, you get to, you are a guest of Throughout Locker, and you get hosted at our event. The unhosted pass, you get free tickets to the event, but. There is a way to get free tickets without that. We're also going to email a coupon code that's valid for 24 hours after this to get a discount on tickets. There's a way to get free tickets. It's very, very easy. Go through Threat Locker University, learn the product, go to Zero Trust World. You're going to pay for the ticket up front. Um, the, the event is a very good event. Uh, that really, we're covering our costs at this event. The tickets aren't expensive anyway, but pass our Cyber Hero certification test. If you pass that test at the event, we will refund your threat locker ticket. Now, just in case you think you can bluff it and not study and go in because you've been using for threat locker, threat locker for three years, we're going to ask questions that things you probably haven't used for three years. 70% of people who took that test last year failed the test, not because it's too hard, but because they didn't go through and learn the other modules. So if you want a free ticket and you don't win today, hopefully you win. Um, Get the ticket, come to Zero Trust World, and then when you're there, pass your Cyber Hero certification. If you don't pass it, you can explain to your boss why the ticket is not free, which is always an interesting uh, conversation, or to your wife, which is even worse. And James Thompson has asked, how does ThreatLocker work with UAC? Do you want to take that one, Danny? So ThreatLocker, so uh, the allow listing, which is what we've been talking about really, is about blocking executables. In addition to that, we also allow you to allow intercept application elevation requests and allow certain applications to run as an admin, even if the user isn't an admin. So if you want to allow the QuickBooks updater to run, but you don't want to make the user an admin, you can just allow that one application to run as an admin. The user, it seamless, intercepts the UAC prompt, and then it allows it to run as an admin. And then the cool part about that is when it's running, we can also ring fence it so it can't hop to other applications. So if you've, if you've used elevation software before, you go to file, open, browse, you can browse to PowerShell. Now you can get to PowerShell as an admin. If you're ring fencing the application, you can't do that. And Alec has asked, how do we sign up for the test at Zero Trust? Zero Trust World, I presume. I mean, Zero literally Trust just World. go to the test center. Yeah, you don't need to sign up in advance. You just go to the test center. There's a study hall there where we're actually going to go through the training on ThreatLocker as well. So if you haven't done it beforehand, if you haven't gone through the university beforehand, 
then that's great. There was there was a few bad people. T technically, you're not allowed to take it twice. We did allow people to take it twice last year because a lot of people came in and their bosses were getting very mad with them for failing the test. So we we did give them the study and call and then say, go and take it again. But I do recommend you study before you take the test because even if you've used Threat Locker for years and you are your resident expert in Threat Locker, there are so many things you probably don't know about the product. So do take the study before you try and take the test. Uh, Jason has also asked, do you have a defined document for QuickBooks update allow with elevation? I have lots of customers with this issue. I don't so know if you want I, I don't even think, yeah, I mean, basically we've got a QuickBooks updater definition. If you create a policy with QuickBooks updater allowed to elevate, it will be allowed to elevate. So that, I mean, if you are a customer, Jason, just get on a call with a solutions engineer. They should be able to help you out with that. If not, talk to us we'll set you with a trial you can try it out and you can see it working in in the flash well listen everyone thank you for joining us again we're going to go into more detail of this at zero trust world i don't know if we're going to squeeze another one in before then hopefully we will if not we look forward to seeing you at zero trust world in sunny florida